thank you very much for the introduction. I'd like to thank the organizers first for giving me this opportunity to speak on transport of the sick child. I realize that I'm quite out of my depth here because I'm a critical care physician and I'm speaking to a whole room of uh, emergency physicians. Um, I realize I stand between you and lunch, certain lunch, so I'll try to be short and sweet about it. Critical care transport has evolved significantly over the last two decades, and the increasing focus on specialized transport systems of the critically ill child has led to improved outcomes and decreased adverse events in this vulnerable group of patients. Um, this patient here is actually one of the hundreds of ill children that we've transported with our service over the last 10 years. A quick overview of what I'm going to talk about. I'll talk a little bit about the evolution of transport and specialized transport teams, why the need for speed isn't really the standard or shouldn't be the standard approach to all transports, what's so special about specialized teams, and if we have some time, I'll talk a little bit about uh, our hospitals or KK Hospital's uh, emergency transport service. So, the Golden Hour is not new. We know about it, it's been used in the context of medically, medical emergencies such as acute myocardial infarction, traumatic brain injury, septic shock. In transport medicine, the golden hour refers to that life-saving critical few hours where swift recognition and treatment of disease or injury results in maximum improved outcomes. These interventions are often not at the scene or not available at the scene and thus require quick stabilization of the patient to allow transfer to an appropriate medical facility. The concept of a specialized transport system was first described during the Napoleonic Wars in the 1800s with injured soldiers in the battlefield and modern specialized transport systems arise from actually military history. In the early 1960s, neonatologists borrowed these military transport concepts to transfer infants needing tertiary level care and the origins of the pediatric critical care transport systems actually evolved from the initial neonatal foundations. So what then? constitutes transport and is there a difference and there actually is. So primary transport is where transport is usually carried out by EMS personnel and that's transferring a patient from scene to a primary medical care facility where early goal directed therapy can be initiated. This usually demands the swoop and scoop approach. You come in, you quickly scoop them up, swoop them out of there as fast as you can and that's to max, minimize, excuse me, minimize delay to medical treatment. The result though is a patient who is often transferred at very high speeds with desperate urgency. And such an approach shouldn't be used or shouldn't be appropriate for a secondary transport. And what really is a secondary transport? It basically refers to the transfer of a patient between hospitals or between hospital environments. This may consist of the movement of a patient to an intensive care unit or from an intensive care unit to the operating theatre to the diagnostic imaging, for example. The overall approach of this secondary transport is one of the meticulous preparation and anticipation of adverse events. This may include resuscitation and stabilization of the patient prior to transfer, and is often described as a stay and play approach, where you try and stabilize the patient, make sure that you've anticipated everything that might possibly go wrong before you even move out of this. Most intensive care retrievals are almost universally secondary transports and should be conducted meticulously. So what about early goal? What is, oh, sorry about that. So how about early goal directed therapy in the, in the emergency department and why is it different, why is primary and secondary transports important to differentiate? And really that's because in the ability to implement early goal directed therapy in the emergency department as opposed to spending time on a hasty transfer without first resuscitating a patient who may potentially benefit that <coughs> resuscitation and when you're actually in a, a facility that can provide the resources um, is quite important. Um, one of the areas where early goal directed therapy has demonstrated most dramatic improvements in mortality is really sepsis and septic shock. Um, this first paper by Dr. Emmanuel Rivers in New England Journal 2001 is um, quite a landmark paper which demonstrated that early goal directed therapy in treating sepsis and septic shock in the emergency de department demonstrated um, dramatic improvement in survival outcomes, even in pediatrics and children. Just being able to provide goal-directed therapy doesn't have to be given by a specialist. This is, the second paper was published in Pediatrics in 2003. As long as you administer it, you could be a community physician. In this particular paper, they improved survival rates by ninefold. So are all transports the same? And really, that's quite a no-brainer. It's not. All transports aren't the same. There are fundamental differences in whether it's a primary transport or a secondary transport. Who the transport personnel are going to be? 
what the approach to the transfer is, and where the patient is, and who is this patient anyway. These differences necessitate an individualized approach to transport based on the location, the location, and the transport team capabilities. So then the question is, well, what's so specialized about a specialized team? And why can't any doctor or any nurse transport a critically ill child? As described by the American Academy of Pediatrics, the aim of a pediatric specialized transport team or a critical care team is to provide as high a standard of intensive care as is available on the intensive care unit. I often counsel and recommend to my own transport staff that if you're standing there, somewhere, in a, in, out of hospital, in an emergency department or in another intensive care unit where there's a child, you're assessing the patient and you're wondering to yourself, I wonder if I need to start this intervention. Then really the question is, if this patient was already in your intensive care unit, would you do this? And if the answer is yes, then I'd say go ahead, but call me first and tell me about it. Um, in a single centre prospective cohort study conducted at the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, sorry, it's really quite small, um, this was published in 2009 in Pediatrics. Just over 1,000 infants and children with requests for retrieval within a 240km radius of the hospital were studied. And basically, this was a unique circumstance where, because of limited uh, specialist team availability, a certain proportion of these children were transferred by a non-specialized team. Those who were transferred by specialized teams actually had a longer total, significantly longer total transport time. Um, despite major, despite similar diagnostic categories, those who were transferred by non-specialized teams had worse pre-ICU prison scores. A prison score is basically a pediatric risk of mortality score, so a composite of 14 variables you measure in the first 24 hours. In this particular paper, they used the first 24 hours prior to ICU admission, and therefore it was it basically demonstrated the period of time during the transfer and during the time in the referral hospital. You might say, well, maybe bad outcomes. I and mean, this particular paper demonstrated that those transferred by non-specialized teams had higher, significantly higher risk of non of uh, unplanned events. 61% in non-specialized teams versus about 1.5% in specialized teams. In addition, mortality was significantly higher in non-specialized teams as well. You might argue maybe the those transferred by non-specialized teams were more ill because of the worse pre-ICU scores. But when they actually adjusted for multivariate multi analysis and adjusted for pre-ICU prison scores, non-specialized teams still stood out as the most significant predictive factor of an unplanned event during the transfer as well as um, mortality. In another paper, this is in 2010, and I'll try to be really quick. Um, this was a retrospective study actually, published in Lancet in 2010 by authors from Children's Acute Transport Service at Great Ormond Street. Uh, they studied the outcomes of children transferred from local hospitals to PICUs in England and Wales over a four hour period. There was an impressive 57,000 admissions to all the PICUs. Approximately 33,000 of these were unplanned and half of these were actually transferred from other hospitals. Patients transferred by specialists versus non-specialized teams had similar prison scores on arrival. But those transferred by specialized teams actually had a significantly higher use of resources after admission. These patients seem to need more invasive, me invasive mechanical ventilation, vasoactive drugs, renal replacement teams. But despite this, um, the use of a specialist team was at least significantly associated with higher ICU survival rates, while distance, additional distance required to travel to the PICU was not associated with the risk of mortality. What does this really mean? It really means, well, the question is, do we really need a pediatric critical care team? And the answer is probably yes. Uh, evidence demonstrates that outcomes of critically ill children improve dramatically when treatment is provided by skilled pediatric specialists. And that's really because initiation of intensive care, critical care, then starts when the team arrives, as opposed to when the patient is transferred and arrives at the receiving hospital. There's less risk of adverse events, carry transfer, improved survival, regardless of how far away they are and how long it took to get there. And the survival benefit was independent of the stabilization time. It didn't matter how long it took to stabilize you, as long as there was actually someone who was trained in pediatric special care transport. So then the question is, well, what is pediatric critical care transport? The team itself comprises of a few um, uh, components. First, you need trained personnel. This is usually someone who is trained in a whole lot of things actually. Trained transport medicine, pediatric medicine. He should have critical care or emergency care skills. And specific, specific additional skill sets include familiarity with logistical difficulties that may be encountered. 
This includes issues with oxygen supply, battery powers are dying, problems with fluids, you don't have the drugs that you actually need. The team also needs to be familiar with the vehicle that, that's being used and the idiosyncrasies of the purpose-built equipment that they carry with them. And this knowledge needs to be sufficient for them to, have, to be able to solve logistical or technical issues that would otherwise be delegated to others in our hospital environment. So if I have a pro pack that I bring with me and it dies halfway, I can't send it to BME, I have to go fix it myself, I have to figure out an alternative. Specialized equipment uh, may consist of isotable ventilators, invasive catalysts and drains, and monitors capable of invasive hemodynamic monitoring. In terms of transport vehicles, locally in Singapore, we use ground ambulances. They use aircraft, um, fixed wing, rotary wing versus water uh, vehicles. Really depends on what's available locally. Um, I transported a patient from Maldives, uh, where part of the journey required using those really tiny boats that ferry between islands. And I remember as we were trying to move the transport deck with the patient in between the boats, I was wondering if something fell off and fell into the Indian Ocean, I wasn't sure how I was going to report that back to my unit system. By the way, sister, really sorry, I dropped this propane into the sea. Thankfully, it didn't happen. Um, and ultimately, for an effective transfer, there should be a transport plan that gives great clarity about who, what, why, and where. Who's this patient? Who's the referring doctor? Who's going to receive this patient? Who's arranging the ground and air logistics? What's wrong with the patient? What interventions and what supports is he on? What supports and intervention may he be required to be on? Um, where is the patient? Where is this hospital actually? Where are we going to send this patient to? How far away is it going to be? And there should be a detailed handoff between the referral transport and receiving physicians, and ideally a single transport coordinator to provide oversight to all aspects of the transfer process. And this is usually an emergency or critical care specialist. So in terms of personnel training, he needs all these aspects. He needs to be trained in transport medicine, pediatrics, critical care, and that individual actually requires quite exemplary multidisciplinary communication skills and the ability to anticipate and react to rapid changes in a high-stress environment. Um, transport medicine in itself can be a specialty or a, a separate field on its own. This is probably illegal, I don't think I should have taken this photo, but this was a, a tarmac stop uh, for refueling. Um, this was one of the jets that we use as a as an air ambulance for some of our international transfers. This is probably the Lear 35, which is a really tiny plane. Um, before you get any romantic or ex terribly exciting notions about flying a private jet to retrieve patients, um, you shouldn't. This is the inside of the, that layer 35 which sits six people at best. The environment during which patient transports occur often colludes to thwart any attempts at providing an equivalent standard of intensive care in a hospital setting. This is inside of the plane. Uh, this little thing here is my patient in the tubes. We strap down the ET, we've got the propack somewhere there, oxygen tanks, ventilator, uh, transport syringes, uh, gas supply, that's one of my transport uh, personnel that's accompanying us. Um, it's small, it's cramped, and it's inevitably chaotic despite all best intentions. Space constraints cause physical discomfort and restricts access to the patient, especially when you've got the blankets and the straps and the tubes and the drains and the catheters all waiting to be entangled and disconnected. Cram environments may also be exacerbated by low light conditions when you're flying at night or you've got this really dim yellow light trying to set a plug in that kind of setting is, is a nightmare. Um, and it further aggravates the sensory deprivation of the transport team. Motion disturbances during transport are also often unpredictable. Turbulence on an airplane, on an airplane uh, sudden breaking of an ambulance, and this can actually result in team-related issues such as nausea and fatigue, may also cause patient-related accidents. Uh, such as tube dislodgement or issues where the equipment or baggage or even passengers' movements may result in a danger to all within the vehicle. In addition, you've got vibration and low frequency high amplitude motion, for example, from the thrum of the engine, the plane engines. This also aggravates motion sickness and fatigue and can disrupt, and can disrupt many modes of patient monitoring. Your pulse oximeter, your cardiopulmonary monitoring, your oxalometric blood pressure determination, all are affected by these low level vibrations. The ambient noise also impairs communication and it blunts the response to the usual auditory cues you get from patient monitors and alarms. Altitude also causes a problem. It affects gas tensions and volumes at different levels, and this is particularly important in patients who are very susceptible 
those with pneumothoraces, bowel obstruction, sinusitis, cough ET tubes, tidal volumes that are delivered by a pressure regulated ventilator, for example. Fixed wing aircraft are also subject patients to market acceleration and deceleration forces, which can have hemodynamic issues or even regional effects. So you've got someone who's at risk of raised intracranial pressure, you've got that patient's head uh, next to the cockpit, for example. During deceleration as you're landing, you're going to be worried about how that's going to affect the intracranial pressures for this particular patient. Um, the transport team also has very mindful of safety. Safety is not like in a hospital where your safety is left to your safety officers and someone else. You have to be responsible for your own safety, your team's safety and the patient's safety as well. I don't know about you, but in my hospital, bless their hearts, our porters are usually these very sweet, nice old aunties and uncles. Um, I don't know why they come with us, but they do. I think it's because we are exporting a patient. But I always worry that my porter or my ambulance driver is going to get a slip disc from lifting our transport decks because equipment is heavy. It's very heavy and as you pile more things on top of it, it's really quite a load to carry. If not strapped securely, equipment such as the oxygen cylinders, battery packs, infusion pumps can also be lethal projectiles in the event of a sudden movement. And I'm not sure if this is particular to pediatrics, but oftentimes the team transport not the team transports not only the patient but the family as well. So the team's actions are actually visible at all times to family members, and they often have the team the transport team often has to manage the stress and the delicate communications between referring doctors, between highly anxious family members, as well as between highly stressed transport team members in a professional manner. So that's not enough. Kids are not small adults either. You can't just take physiology from an adult and transfer it to a child. Um, they differ in basic anatomy as well as cardiopulmonary physiology. Children respond differently than adults in the face of hemodynamic instability and have much less respiratory reserves than adults in the face of lung pathology. Disease processes are also markedly different and hence therapeutic interventions. An adult with respiratory distress is unlikely to have the same cause as a neonate with respiratory distress. And drug doses are a huge issue. For an adult, you guys have it quite easy. One vial or one ampule usually is equivalent to a single standardized adult dose. Children vary in size and weight. You can have a 500 gram neonate to a 60 kilo five-year-old, quite common in Singapore. Um, so adrenaline, resuscitation adrenaline can range anywhere from 0.3 mils to 5 mils per dose. Pharmacokinetics are also actually quite different depending on age. Neonates tend to have uh, some degree of renal teleography, and the cytochrome P450 system varies according to age as well. In terms of critical care experience, we require that our personnel have um, critical care skills and knowledge, and this includes the ability to provide advanced airway support, central line access monitoring, they should be able to provide continuous arterial line pressure monitoring, and should be able to prescribe and titrate basoactive agents as well as mechanical ventilation. So at the end of the day, are we really necessary? Would you really sell the point that all critically ill children should be transferred by a pediatric specialized transport team? And I would say yes, because we basically are able to provide aggressive continuous intensive care interventions and monitoring throughout the transport process. But unfortunately, it has to be balanced with how long is it going to take for us to get to where you are, whether this patient really requires critical care interventions, and unfortunately, in our region, the economics of transport. As well. If I had to transfer a patient from, let's say, Vietnam to Singapore by air ambulance, um, if you employ an air evacuation company which employs our services, for example, that costs anywhere in the range of forty to sixty thousand dollars for the transfer. And, and I'm going to end up this segment if with a well, are we really necessary? If you have a sick infant or child, a pediatric critical care transport team is, I think, best serves you in terms of giving the patient the best goals and outcome. And that's because we are able to provide uh, early goal directed therapy and stabilization with the benefit of specialized skills and knowledge and equipment, and ultimately the ability to provide critical care interventions as soon as we get there. Um, okay, four minutes more, five minutes more. I'll end off really quickly with a quick introduction to KK Hospital's emergency transport service, and I promise this will be really quick. KK Hospital has a children's emergency transport service, or CHATS for short. We've provided emergency transport for critically ill infants and children since 2004. The team comprises of either a pediatric or neonatal critical care transport physician and a critical care nurse with specialized equipment and customized decks. 
In terms of international transports in our 10 year history, we remain the only dedicated fully equipped pediatric and neonatal critical care service for ill patients in the Southeast Asian region. About 10 to 15 percent of our missions are international. Um, we just completed a transfer or a retrieval of a patient from Papua New Guinea about two days ago, thankfully a day before the earthquake actually hit the region, which is quite thankful actually. Um, we perform on average about 90 to 100 missions a year. We've targeted out-of-door times for local transfers at between 15 and 30 minutes. It takes us about 15 minutes to 5 hours to stabilize the patient. And this is important. It doesn't matter how long I've taken to stabilize the patient. The most important thing is that I am actively stabilizing this patient. And we are essentially a mobile intensive care unit. This is one of the bags that we carry in with us with all the necessary intensive care equipment and drugs. In terms of statistics, 35% of the patients require interventions on site. This could be anything from giving intravenous fluids, setting, resetting of the IV line, putting in our arterial line, or adjusting the endotracheal tube. Um, just over 56, just over 50 percent of our patients uh, were on mechanical ventilation, and 12 percent of those were on uh, vasoactive medications. In terms of adverse event rates, we roughly sit at about 4 percent at the moment for uh, inter-transport adverse events. Um, I think we had a case probably about a year or half ago from Kutik Park where there was a question about do we perform ECMO transports? Um, we've recently started a formal in-hospital ECMO program at Peking Hospital and there are plans in the future to incorporate an inter-hospital ECMO transport program. To date, we've performed about two inter-hospital pediatric ECMO transfers and about five to six intra-hospital transfers since introduction of the program. Uh, this picture was actually taken just like two weeks ago. This was one of our post op cardiac patients on ECMO who required a transfer to diagnostic imaging for, our cardio for, a, uh, for a CT angiogram. Off-site calculation for ECMO, and essentially in the emergency department, that's going to be ECPR, is still currently on a case-to-case -case basis. We work very closely with the referral team, as well as the cardiothoracic surgeons, with regards to deciding criteria for calculation. If you do have a case that you strongly feel would benefit from ECMO in the emergency department, please call KK really early, like within five minutes of your CPR, because by the time things get organized, this patient's going to have been undergoing CPR for about a good 20 minutes or so, and that's probably at the threshold of should I call off resuscitation in the first place. Um, I'll end off really quickly. The overall objective of a pediatric critical care team to provide transport is to improve the outcomes of critically ill and injured pediatric patients who are not in proximity to a hospital that provides the required level of care. To that end, best care for these ill patients really starts when the patient arrives in your emergency department under your care and continues when the specialist team arrives to continue further stabilization. With that, yay, it's 12.30. Thank you very much for your time and attention. I'm really happy to answer any questions. Um, I'd also like to thank our dedicated staff who made this service possible. Thank you.